Brothers and sisters, please open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 6, verses 46 to 49. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house, who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against the house, and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard it and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation, against which the stream beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. So everyone knows this, if you build a house on sand, it will last for a while, it will look nice, and it will stay there for a while, but eventually that house will come down. It will collapse because it has no foundation. But if you lay a good foundation, if you build a house upon a good foundation, upon a rock, then that house will endure. It will endure any conditions. Any builder will tell you this. If you build it upon sand, it will come down, and the ruin of that house was great, it says. So what does this mean to build upon the rock? building upon the rock. Who is this rock? In Jewish typology, the rock or the stone, it's Petra in Greek and Aven in Hebrew, has to do with the Messiah. Whenever you see the rock or the stone in the Bible, this is a type of the Messiah. In Psalm 118 verse 22, it says the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. In Isaiah chapter 8 verse 14, he will be as a sanctuary, but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offence to both the houses of Israel as a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. You have the same thing in Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes in him will not act hastily. It's talking about the Messiah, prophecy of the Messiah right there. Now Psalm 118 verse 22, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Jesus quoted this to the Pharisees when he was telling the parable of the vineyard. Matthew 21 verse 42, Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing and it is marvellous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whom it falls, it will grind him to powder. Now Paul also quotes this in Romans chapter 9, verse 33, talking about Israel's rejection of the Messiah. This cornerstone, this stone was rejected by Israel. When Jesus came, he was rejected. Now Peter quotes all of these three Old Testament passages in the same passage in 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 6 to 8. Peter here is explaining about how this stone, this stone that we see in the Old Testament is talking about the Messiah. 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 6 to 8. Coming to, him as, coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men but chosen by God and precious also as living stones you are, being built up in a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes in him will be no means put to shame. That's Isaiah 28 verse 16. Therefore, to you who believe he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Psalm 118 verse 22 and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offence, Isaiah chapter 8 verse 14. They stumble, being disobedient to the word to which they were also appointed. So two categories of people there. You have those who believe, to those who believe he is a precious stone, but to those who are disobedient he is a stumbling stone, a rock of offence. This is what Peter is saying here. Now in the book of Daniel chapter 2, there was a vision of King Nebuchadnezzar. He had a vision of this statue. Now, not to go into this too deeply, but this statue represented four empires. You had four empires there in the different layers of the statue. And then this stone came and smashed this statue to pieces. Daniel chapter 2, verses 31 to 35. 
You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. This image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest of arms and silver, and its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron. So these represent different empires. Again, we're not going to go into this too deeply. These represent different empires that will come and go over the centuries. Its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. That's the empire that will be in the last days. You watched while a stone was cut out with hands, which struck the image on its feet and iron of clay, and broke them into pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze and the silver and the gold were crushed together. They became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain that filled the whole earth. So further in this chapter, in Daniel 2 verses 44 to 45, Daniel explains to us what this means. And in the last days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain with hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. So all these empires, all these world empires, this satanic empire that will be in the last days, Jesus is going to come and tear down these world empires and he is going to reign forever on David's throne. This is what this image in Daniel relates to. But the point here is that the stone, the rock, is the Messiah. Whenever you see the stone or the rock in the Bible, it's talking about the coming Messiah. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 19 to 20. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. We also see this in the story of Israel coming out of Egypt. When Israel came to the Red Sea they wandered in the wilderness for a time that in Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 to 7, tells us the story of another rock. Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of Sin, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped in Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it you have brought us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of, the, of Israel. Also take in your hand your rod with which you struck the river and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb and you shall strike the rock and water will come out of it that the people may drink and Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel so he called the name of the place Mesa and Meriba because of the contention of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord saying is the Lord among us or not so it says in Hebrews that God swore in his wrath that they would never enter his rest because of their unbelief because they complained now, Paul tells us about this story in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and he tells us who was this rock. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 to 4. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, that's the cloud which the Israelites followed in the wilderness, all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Christ was that rock. And in your Bibles, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the rock there is with a capital R. That's for a reason. It was Christ who was that rock. Now, just as the Israelites were drinking that water from the rock, this is a picture of us drinking the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in John chapter 7, verses 37 to 39, and the last and greatest day of the festival, that's the Feast of Tabernacles, which we're going to be speaking about soon, the last and greatest day of that festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, now how many times do I get told to not shout in the high street? Why are you shouting? Jesus shouted. This is how Jesus preached. Jesus stood up and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, 
as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within him. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So the Spirit wasn't given until Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. So again, in the Bible, water or rain is a type of the Holy Spirit. Whenever you see rain or water in the Bible, this is a representation of the Holy Spirit. So the Israelites drinking that water from the rock in the wilderness is a picture of us partaking of the Holy Spirit from the rock who is Christ. Again, in Jewish typology, the stone all has to do with the Messiah. So why is it then that Jesus told us to build our house upon the rock? Because only houses which have firm foundations will endure. It will endure any conditions. When you build a house with a firm foundation, it doesn't matter what conditions there will be, storms, hurricanes, wind, rain, whichever, it will endure these conditions. Likewise, only a life built upon Jesus Christ can endure any conditions. It's only a life which is built upon Jesus Christ which will endure. People say, but my life is built upon my career, my, my life is built upon my kids or my spouse. What happens when that's taken from you? What happens when your job is taken from you? Your job can be taken at any moment. What happens when your kids don't want to know you anymore? What happens when your kids disappear because they've met some controlling woman and they don't want to speak to you anymore? What happens then? Your life is built upon your kids. They can be taken from you at any time. What about your family or your spouse? They can let you down at any time. When you build the, your life upon these things, when these are the central focus of your life, they're going to let you down. It's not a firm foundation. People build their lives upon these fallible things. The rock, however, isn't going anywhere. The rock is Jesus Christ. He's not going anywhere. That rock which you lay in the ground can't be moved. It's not going anywhere. And likewise, Jesus Christ is not going anywhere. He is the firm foundation upon which we must build our lives because he is not going anywhere. Build your house upon the rock. This is the first thing that you should be worrying about. Now, last week I spoke about believers who are still on milk, believers who don't want to grow, believers who are in their comfort zones and don't want to come out of their comfort zones. You all hear that okay? Believers who don't want to come out of their comfort zones. Now this is kind of the flip side to that. We often see also many believers, many new converts, new believers in Jesus, or people who are even searching and not even saved yet, who are reading about end time prophecy and conspiracy theories about the mark of the beast and about the antichrist, watching clips on YouTube about who the antichrist is going to be and about what the mark of the beast is going to be. And these are people who haven't grown yet, they're not even saved yet maybe, and they're, they're getting into end time prophecy. Now it's good to be into these things, we should be into these things, Jesus said so, but there needs to be a firm foundation laid. There's no point in getting into Bible prophecy before you've even laid a firm foundation upon the rock. I was guilty of this myself when I first got saved. I got born again, straight away I, I had this obsession with end time prophecy, I was fascinated by it. Now that's good, it's a good thing to have, but I hadn't yet laid that firm foundation. I went straight into Revelation, I went straight into the rapture, I kept watching clips on YouTube about the rapture, about the mark of the beast, who's the Antichrist going to be, all this kind of stuff. And I was fascinated by it. Then a couple of years later when life got a bit tough, when I left the army, I struggled to adapt back to civilian life, I backslid, I went back to my old ways. I backslid and went back to drinking, womanising, you name it. Why? Because I hadn't built that firm foundation upon the rock. I'd already got into these, you know, not conspiracy theories as such, but you know, these, these are end time prophecy videos on YouTube and stuff, and I, and I spent hours watching them. But I had not laid, laid that firm foundation upon the rock, as Jesus said to do. And because of that, I went back to my old ways. Now, too many people get saved, delivered from darkness, and go straight into ministry, straight into evangelism. They don't give themselves a chance to grow and to build that foundation. Then when challenging times come, when the floods and the storms begin to beat against that house, what happens? They end up backsliding and going back to their old ways. Why? Because they hadn't built a firm foundation upon the rock. They were thrown into the deep end, you could say. Now, when Paul encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9, he then went and spent three years in Arabia being taught by the Lord. Paul didn't go straight into ministry. He spent three years in Arabia being taught by the Lord before he even went back to Jerusalem. There are people who have been let down by churches. You get let down by churches a lot. 
they end up falling away completely. Why? Because they didn't build their foundation upon the rock. Their faith wasn't in Christ, it was in men. When we go out and evangelise, I hear this kind of testimony quite a lot. I've heard many people say that they, they used to have faith, they used to go to church, but they had a bad experience in church and now they want nothing to do with God or the Bible. They have no interest. If your church lets you down, find a better church. If your pastor gets caught embezzling church money, find a better pastor, find a better church. If you fall away because of things like this, it shows that your faith was never in Christ, your faith was in men. If your so-called Christian spouse cheats on you and you fall away, it means that your faith was not in Christ, your faith was in people, men. It means you didn't build your house upon the rock, you built upon the sand. Look what it says in Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 5 to 8. Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land which is not inhabited. But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes. But its leaf will be green and it will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will it cease from yielding fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Now there's quite a lot in there. The water, as I said, is a type of the Holy Spirit. When you have a tree which is planted by the water, its roots go down into the water. Then when the heat comes, it doesn't matter, it will still bear fruit, it will still be green. Now heat in the Bible has to do with persecution. Persecution, when you see the parable of the sower, for example, in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus said about the stone which falls on stony places. Immediately it shoots up, but it has no depth. Then the sun scorches it and it withers away. As soon as that heat comes, it has no root, so it withers away. And then he explains what this means in Matthew chapter 13, verses 20 to 21. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises before the word, because of the word, immediately he stumbles. So heat has to do with persecution. When we have our roots deep in the, in the water, which is the Holy Spirit, the persecution can come, but we will continue to bear fruit. We won't just wither away as soon as that heat comes. That's what Jesus is saying here. If you come into persecution and you fall away, it is because you didn't build your house upon the rock. You built it upon the sand, and that's why it came crashing down at the first sign of trouble. The goal for every single one of us, every single believer, the goal should be to come to a place in your walk with God where you're able to say, no matter who lets me down, no matter what trials or tribulations or persecutions come my way, no matter what I go through, my relationship with God will not be shaken. It will withstand any test. That is the goal every single one of us should be looking to. Now, the only way to reach that goal, the only way for the house to withstand any storm, any flood, any weather conditions, is to build the house upon the rock, the rock, capital R, who is Christ. Now this is not a goal that you can just achieve overnight. This is not something God expects you to achieve just like that. How do you build this firm foundation? How do you reach a point in your life where you can say that my relationship with God will not be shaken regardless of any trials, regardless of any tribulations, regardless of any persecutions, regardless of any weather conditions, my relationship with God will never be shaken. How can you come to a place in your life where you can say this? Well, the same as you would with any relationship, you spend time with that person. You spend time with the, relation, with the person who you want to have a relationship with. When you're courting someone, I don't like the term dating, that's not biblical, when you're courting someone, you spend time with that person and you get to know them. If you don't spend time with that person, then you're not going to get to know them and you're not going to be able to build a foundation with that person. You don't just rush into a marriage, you spend time with that person before you rush into marriage. And when you've laid a firm foundation, your marriage will then stand the test of time. If you haven't laid a firm foundation, then your marriage will not stand the test of time. It's as simple as that. Marriages that are built upon a firm foundation will endure. Marriages that are not built upon a firm foundation will not endure. It's as simple as that. It will all come crashing down, just like that house which is built upon the sand. We need to be spending time with God. We need to be investing in our relationship with Him. Too many believers are just happy to 
be watching TV, they're happy to spend hours on social media, they're happy just to be spending time with unsaved friends whilst their Bibles remain on the shelf collecting dust. This is what is causing these, these relationships with God to come down just as those houses did. They're not spending time with God. They're enjoying the things of this world whilst neglecting their relationship with God. And this is why James chapter 4 verse 4 says, do not, do not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Can you believe that? If you are a friend of the world, you are an enemy of God. If you are a friend of the things of this world, you are God's enemy. Can you believe that? That's quite a verse, isn't it? Something for us to think about. We need to be one, spending regular time with God in prayer, studying our Bibles and fellowshipping with like-minded believers. This is what we should be doing. These are the three things that we need. Prayer, Bible study and fellowship with like-minded believers. And this all involves self-discipline. This is just, this is a... Um, very loud today, aren't they, the bikes? We don't normally get this, do we? <laughs> this involves self-discipline. It's a voluntary act on our part. God's not going to do it for us. He's going to give us the opportunities. He's going to give us the means, but he's not going to do it for us. This comes as a voluntary act on our part. We have to do it. Now, at minimum, we need to be spending, or sorry, starting every day and finishing every day with the Lord. At minimum, we must start and finish every day in the Lord's presence, in prayer and in the Word. If you want to build a firm foundation, then you must be prioritising God in every area of your life. Every area of your life, God must take priority. If there's anything in your life which is taking priority over God, you know what Jesus says? You know what Jesus says about you? He says you are not worthy of him. Matthew chapter 10, verses 37 to 38. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. If you prioritise other things other than Jesus Christ in your life, then you are not worthy of him. That's what it says. It's very harsh, isn't it? But that's what it says. I can't change the words. When believers aren't studying their Bibles, when believers are spending, uh, not spending time with God, it's always the same reasons, isn't it? I haven't got the time. I'm, I'm so busy with work right now. My kids take up all my time. Yes, life is busy. Yes, we will have jobs. Yes, we will have family commitments. Of course we do. But God's not going to accept any of those excuses. Those excuses aren't going to wash with God. They wash with men. Yes, I understand. I understand life is busy. I understand you have commitments. God's not going to accept any of these excuses. When we don't prioritise him in our lives, he's not going to be understanding like we are. He's not going to be lenient. God is not lenient on these things. Yes, life is busy, but every single one of us don't have any excuse to not make God priority in our life. You will not be able to build a firm foundation when other things are coming before God. We need to be giving him the first and the best of our time. The first and the best of our time because he doesn't accept leftovers. He does not accept leftovers. God does not do leftovers. When God gave the commandment to tithe, the first tenth of the produce, which comes from Deuteronomy chapter 14, it was the first tenth and it was the best tenth. It wasn't what was left over. It was the first tenth. He doesn't accept leftovers. So why is it we give God our leftover time? Why is it that we try and fit God in at some point in our day and give him what's left over? He doesn't accept this. Oh, I've got a very busy day, but I'm going to see if I can fit God in at some point in my day. No, that's not how it works with God. It might be how it works with other people, but it's not how it works with the Lord. How do you think it makes God feel when we have that attitude? How do you think it will make your spouse feel if I say, I've got a really busy day, but I'm going to try and squeeze you in at some point in the day. If I can, I can. If I can't, I can't. But I'll try and fit you in. How would your spouse feel if you, if you treated them that way? How do you think it makes God feel? I've had conversations with believers before who say that they get their prayer time and their Bible study time done on their commute, for example, on their way to work whilst I'm on my way to work. That's when I do my Bible time. That's when I do my prayer time. Now, I'm not saying don't do these things, but killing two birds with one stone, that's not your main time with God. You can't be killing two birds with one stone with God. Praying whilst driving. A lot. I, I pray whilst I drive, but that's not my only time with God. There's nothing wrong in praying whilst you're driving. There's nothing wrong in reading your Bibles on the train on the way to work. But that can't be your only time with God. That can't be the only time you're having with the Lord. Kidding two birds with one stone. God doesn't accept leftovers. You need to be setting aside and prioritising quality time with the Lord. It doesn't have to be quantity, but quality. It doesn't have to be all day. It doesn't have to be hours. 
but quality time with the Lord. Even if it means setting your alarm half an hour early, start your day in the Lord's presence. Set a time, set aside some quality time with the Lord. Setting aside and prioritizing this time where nothing will interrupt or come before this time with the Lord. Again, it doesn't have to be all day. It doesn't have to be for hours. Just a little bit of time that you give to God as you start and finish your day. Then there's nothing wrong in addition to this in praying whilst you're driving, praying whilst you're doing the dishes or reading your Bibles on the bus or the train on the way to work. Do those things, but that can't be your only main time with God. Your only main time with God should be prioritized time which you dedicate to the Lord every single day. Now, of course, don't beat yourself up if there's some days where you don't manage this, but it should be a lifestyle that we get used to. Start and finish every day in the Lord's presence. You can't be kidding two birds with one stone with God. Prioritize him in every area of your life and your relationship with him will then grow. I promise you, it will grow when you prioritize your time with the Lord. You can't build a firm foundation upon the rock without spending quality time with God. And this applies to everyone, not just new believers, not just those who are building a foundation, but for experienced believers who also know the Lord. We should be spending quality, prioritized time with the Lord. How else do we build this firm foundation? Jesus told us in our opening text in Luke chapter 6, verse 46. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I tell you what he is like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. Do what he says, obey him. It's not just about accepting Christ, it's about following him. People always say, you need to accept Christ into your heart. We need to accept Christ into our hearts. You don't see that statement once in the Bible. Jesus never said, accept me into your heart. He said, follow me, follow me. This is what Jesus said. We read it from Matthew chapter 10 already, verses 37 to 38. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Matthew 16, verse 24. Whoever wants to be my disciple must then deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. John chapter 8, verse 12. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John chapter 10, verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they what? Accept me? No, they follow me. Don't, we don't just believe in Christ, we don't just accept Christ, we follow him. We follow what he says, we obey him, we do what he says. John chapter 14, uh, 14 verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. John, uh, 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 to 4, and by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Again, more black and white statements. If you claim to know Jesus Christ, but you're not keeping what he said, if you're not obeying what he said, the Bible calls you a liar. Can you believe that? We used to follow Satan, didn't we? Satan was the one that who we followed before we knew the Lord. He used to be our master. He used to be the one who we obeyed. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. And you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, that's the devil, Satan, the spirit which is now at the work in the sons of disobedience, those who disobey the Lord, the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the, like the rest of mankind. By nature, children of wrath. No one is ever born a child of God. We're all born children of wrath. To become a child of God, you have to be born again. Don't confuse being made in the image of God with being a child of God. No one is ever born a child of God. He gives us the right to become a child of God, John chapter 1, through receiving him, through believing in Jesus. We have the right to become children of God. To be a child of God, you must be born again. Now, when it says here in Ephesians 2, the sins and trespasses in which you once walked, the Greek word there is peripateo. In more specifically in the Greek, it doesn't just mean walk, but it means walking without purpose, wandering or meandering, walking without purpose or going around in circles. It's more specific. When we walk somewhere, it tends to be with a purpose. I'm walking to the shops, I'm walking to work. You're walking somewhere. But the word here in Greek denotes more specifically wandering, nowhere. You're, just, you're going nowhere. You're going around in circles. This is what the Greek word particularly means. But when we made that decision to repent and believe in the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ, 
He became our new master and then we began walking with him. We began following Christ. We stopped following the ways of the devil and we began following Jesus and we began obeying him in his ways, his ways which lead to eternal life. He's the one who we now obey. He is the one who we now follow. So to lay a firm foundation, to lay to build the house upon the rock, you must be prioritizing time with the Lord and you must be obeying him, doing what he says. Once you have laid that firm foundation upon the rock, once the house is ready to withstand any storms or any floods, then and only then are you ready to carry out the work which the Lord has for you. The Lord prepared work for you since the foundation of the world, it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God had prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now the Bible says that we're going to receive rewards for these works. Don't confuse rewards for works and salvation. We're going to receive rewards for the work that we've done for the Lord, for the calling that, we, that he has for us. How good or how bad we fulfill that calling, we're going to receive rewards for this. We're not going to receive rewards for any work done in the flesh, any work done in selfish motive. We're not going to get rewarded for this. We're only going to get rewarded for the work which God has called us to, which is done in the spirit. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 Verses 9 to 10 says that every single one of us is going to appear before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now this isn't to be confused with the great white throne judgment, which is in Revelation chapter 20, when all the unbelievers are cast into the lake of fire, Gehenna in Greek. It's not to be confused with this. This is the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. It's the beamer in Greek, the beamer seat. So this is like an Olympic podium where we go up and receive our rewards from the Lord for how well or how bad we fulfilled our calling. Now, it says that our work is going to be tested. Our work is going to be tested by fire. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 9 to 15. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given to me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay other than that which has been laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, or wood or hay and straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. Our work is going to be tested by fire. The fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burnt up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet as so through fire. So our work is going to be tested. Things like gold and silver and precious stones, these things aren't going to be consumed in the fire. These things are going to last. Things like wood or, or straw or hay, these things are going to be consumed. Works done in the flesh, works done with selfish motive, works done that are not built upon the foundation, these are the wood and the, and the straw and the hay. It's going to get consumed in the fire when it's tested. But the work which is done for the Lord in the spirit, the work which is done upon that foundation, this is the gold and the silver and the precious stones. And this is going to last in that test of the fire. And this is only what we're going to get rewarded for. If you present your works to the Lord and it's all consumed in the fire, you won't get any rewards. It's only work done in the spirit, work done for the Lord on that foundation which will endure that fire. That is what you're going to get rewarded for. So remember that when you're carrying out the Lord's work. Are you doing this for selfish motive? Are you doing it in the flesh? Or are you doing it in the spirit? That will determine whether you get rewarded for it or not. Now, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says, Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. If your house is going to survive these demonic attacks, if your house is going to survive these floods, these storms, when the storm beats against your house, is it going to come crashing down or will it stand firm? If your house is built upon the sand, it will be okay for a while, it will look nice, you can build a house upon the sand and it will stand for a while. But it won't last. As soon as conditions get bad, it will eventually come crashing down. It will eventually collapse. The only way your house will withstand any storm, any demonic attacks, is if you lay a firm foundation built upon the rock, and that rock is Yeshua, 
HaMashiach, our Lord and Saviour. He is the rock, capital R in the text, and he is the one upon which we build our foundation. Any house built upon him will last. Any house built upon the sand will not last. It's as black and white as that. So I urge every single one of us to build our house upon the rock, invest in your relationship with the Lord, and it will endure any test. He has promised us that. These are promises of God which he gives us in his word. Hallelujah, what a great God we serve. Amen. Let us finish in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, uh, for this time together. We thank you for this word that you've spoken to us, Lord. We thank you for the eternal truth of your word. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that you've given each one of us, Lord, to discern and learn the word of God. We thank you, Lord, that that spirit conforms us into the image of Christ Jesus. And Lord, help every single one of us to build our life upon him, to lay that firm foundation and to not build upon the sand, but to build upon that rock who is your dear son, who you gave for us as a sacrifice. Help us, Lord, to look to him. Help us, Lord, to follow him, obey him and to do what he says. Help us, Lord, to reject the evil ways of this world. And as this world becomes more and more dark, more and more evil, help us to be shining lights in this darkness, Lord. Help us to be shining lights for Jesus. Help us to be ambassadors of Jesus Christ in this dark world, Lord. And we just pray in his name that you'll give us that strength, that you'll give us a double portion of the spirit to each of us, Lord, as we continue walking on this narrow way, as we continue fighting the good fight, and run in this race. Give us, Lord, an abundance of the Spirit so we may endure. Give us, Lord, that firm foundation which is your dear Son. Thank you, Lord, for all you've done. Thank you for his sacrifice. And thank you, Lord, that his blood has cleansed us from our sin and transferred us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light and that now we are no longer children of wrath but we are children of God, citizens of heaven. We thank you Lord that our citizenship is with you in heaven Lord. We thank you for that amazing immutable truth. Praise you Lord. Thank you for this day. In the precious name of Yeshua HaMashiach we pray. Amen. Praise God.